Uh, I'm James Shoemake. I'm a research professional here at ICER for another two months before I go do my PhD. Uh, I just recently, well, a year ago, I graduated from UAF with a degree in a master's degree in natural resource management, and my thesis was on subsistence and her subsistence herring in Sitka Sound. And I looked at um, a social ecological system of, of of subsistence herring in terms of where people harvest, why people harvest those area in those areas, what makes them important, how can we measure. Uh, things in a more quantitative way and how can we also incorporate social science methods and qualitative data into understanding the big kind of the bigger picture of herring. Um, herring is a really fascinating topic. I really didn't know much about the fishery um, going into this thesis. I chose it. Uh, I was interested in Sitka fisheries. I had worked in Sitka. I was at SJ Sheldon Jackson College when the college closed in Sitka, and I worked in the fish hatcheries there in Sitka. And so I, I picked herring as kind of an, an interesting, controversial issue, um, probably the most controversial fisheries issue I could find. Um, and I'm interested in these kind of small scale fisheries. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is just a subset of what I did with my thesis. And it was looking at uh, metrics and trying to explain why the fishery is unsuccessful, um, what are, what's driving effort, what's driving success, and how can we measure that in a very quantitative way um, that fishery managers can understand. Because what often happens is, is you have social science data that is in a different language from what fisheries biologists understand. Um, and so I was trying with my thesis to go from kind of this ethnographic data to something quantitative that that the biologists could hopefully read and understand better. And so one aspect of this was the idea of participation and effort and success. And um, so the title of the presentation is, it isn't just about participation, factors affecting harvest in the Sitka Sound subsistence herring fishery. And so just to kind of give a quick intro and overview of what I'm gonna talk about. First, I'm gonna talk about what drives success and why we're even talking about this issue. Um, we're going to define some terms that I'm going to use, then I'm going to look at how successful has the fishery been from a subsistence standpoint, what the trends in participation have been, uh, how fishing takes place in time and space, which was a major aspect of my thesis research, and then looking at a better definition of effort. And um, then finally we'll wrap up with some conclusions and questions. So why are we talking about this? Uh, in 2002, Sitka Tribe of Alaska approached the Board of Fisheries. They wanted to designate certain areas as being culturally and traditionally important for subsistence herring use. Originally, the Board of Fish did not approve of those areas, but what they did instead was they issued a finding for the amount necessary for subsistence. Uh, and so the ANS, it was originally based on the available data that was that they had. Some of it was from the 90s and earlier. Um, and as a result, Fish and Game Division of Subsistence uh, entered into a memorandum of understanding with STA to try and collect better data. Can I just briefly ask a clarifying question? Yes. Um, what in uh, asking for these um, recognition of what, what they asked for, what would that have meant? What was the, I know they didn't get it, but right. in brief, so, what, were, what, would, what would the implications of that have been? And I'm, and I'm going to build up to that a little bit, okay. too. Um, so they wanted a subsistence-only zone. They wanted areas to, to be excluded from the commercial fishery, essentially. And it, it comes up again in 2012. Yes. Actually, on that line, amount necessary for subsistence is that the amount of harvest in pounds? Yes, for it's it's a calculation that says, and it's actually like a statewide calculation um, for how much of the resources needed to be shared throughout the state. Although most of that is shared around Southeast Alaska, some of it does get shared around the state. So the Fish and Game tries to determine, you know, what is the minimum? They they set a threshold. What's the minimum amount, and what's kind of the upper amount, and the and so and there are there are regulatory there's it's 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 not exactly enforced in terms of if this isn't met you know these things can't happen per se 
but it, it's a guideline for how much is needed by the communities who rely on these resources. And ANS findings are done around the state for a variety of resources. And so is the ANS just for Sitka or is it for the? It's for the whole state. Um, most of the harvest, it occurs in Sitka or by communities in the area of Sitka. Um, but like, the, and, and, and the amount that gets shared is also kind of relative to how much is actually harvested. So the more people harvest, the more they have to share. Um, so, so then again in 2012 in, at the Ketchikan meeting, um, which I had the joy of being able to be there for the whole week of meetings, um, this issue came up again. And there was, this time there were six proposals total that dealt with this conflict between subsistence and commercial. And part of the problem is, is that the commercial fishery takes place first, and then the herring spawn, and then the, the harvesters will go out and they'll set branches hemlock branches, trees a lot of times, and the herring will spawn on the trees and then they harvest the herring eggs off the trees, or they can, they can uh, harvest kelp either, either by diving for it or for snagging it with, with snag hooks. Um, and so uh, of the six proposals, um, two of these again had to do with setting aside that cultural space. Uh, and even though there were only six proposals in this conflict between subsistence and commercial, most of the public comment had to do with these six proposals. The, and this has been the case for several cycles now. Uh, in the previous cycle, which was um, 2009, they held it in Sitka. And reports that I heard was that there were like 400 people showed up for public comment, most of them dealing just with herring subsistence policy issues. Um, they had to shut down public testimony at one point because they, they just couldn't, uh, uh, they couldn't have everybody talk that wanted to speak. So this is a huge issue. Um, and so, so part of the problem is that the subsistence harvesters believe that the commercial fishery is interfering with their subsistence uh, use that when fishermen go in and make sets on schools of herring, that it disrupts the the natural movements of the herring, that it stresses them out, and that as a result of that stress, they spawn prematurely. They spawn in areas that they wouldn't normally spawn in, and so their remedies over the last several cycles has been to either scale back the commercial fishery, or some people would just like to see it eliminated outright. And this is. Highly contentious because this is a multi-million dollar fishery that takes place. Some of the commercial openers last a half hour um, and net millions of dollars of revenue. Um, there, are, there are only about 50 permit holders in the commercial fishery. And uh, most of them are from Alaska. Um, only about a quarter to a third, I think, are from Southeast. Um, but so there were two proposals in 2012 that again dealt with the subsistence only zone. One of, the first proposal was generated by an elder from Sitka tribe. The second proposal was a compromise proposal generated by the Regional Advisory Council. And so this is Sitka Sound. And the, uh, this top portion here was part of the original proposal. The Advisory Council kind of cut it off. Whoops. Yeah, if you touch that. Oh. Here, I'll just use the uh, laser pointer. Um, the, uh, the advisory council kind of gnawed off that north end there. And then there was a third proposal that was generated by the board itself that this area here was really contentious. The commercial fishery does take place in this pocket. It's really deep right there. And Herring do school in there. And so the, the, the industry wanted to see that area removed uh, well, they didn't want to see the subsistence only zone passed at all, but they were willing to, 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 to give a little compromise if they could get this part of the area removed. So what was eventually approved included kind of this inner island area right here, and then it kind of shoots across right there. The board did approve that board drafted version of the subsistence only zone. So on the other side of this issue, the industry at the same time submitted proposals that would regulate the subsistence fishery. Uh, 
they generally dealt with issues of there's not enough oversight, there's not enough good data on these fisheries. We don't really, we keep, you know, they wanted to institute one of their, one of the things they wanted to do was a dockside krill survey, kind of like uh, sport fish does with salmon. So you pull into the dock, you have a boat full of trees with herring eggs on them. Somebody walks up to you, says, where did you get your eggs? How many sets did you make? They would weigh the weight. They would do weights right there on the dock to weigh out how many eggs there were. And the, and, and then that would be, you know, data that could be used for management. Um, the other issue, the other proposal they had was uh, permits. They wanted to issue cards, basically, which happens in some subsistence uh, fisheries around the state where you get cards. Uh, and actually, the, the, the row on kelp fishery has a permit card for it. But anybody can get the permit card. It's not a limited entry type thing. It's just a way of tracking better data. The problem with some of this was that the Board of Fish can't direct fishing game to spend money. So they couldn't approve a dockside krill survey per, you know, a scheme because that would force fishing game to spend money that fishing game might not necessarily have. Uh, so neither of these actually passed. But what was interesting to me as I was watching this, this unfold was the narrative that was coming from the commercial fishery industry was that the main reason needs aren't being met is because people just aren't fishing. One fisherman actually said that, that, the, oh, the eggs are there. If they would just get out there and get them, they, they could get what they need. Um, and so that really got me to thinking about um, participation. And so this is comment that I, two quotes that I pulled from public comment documents submitted by the Southeast Herring Conservation Alliance, which is an industry-led uh, political action committee, for lack of a better word. Um, and they used subsistence division data report to try to make the argument that, oh, it's just a matter of participation. And so you can see those two quotes here where they say, participation in the subsistence harvest has declined in recent years. Um, the ANS has been met six of the nine years. Uh, that didn't include data for 2011, 2012, neither of which met ANS goals. And um, it, uh, it's due to a lack of reason. It's not due to a lack of reasonable opportunity, but rather reduced effort and participation. So, with any subsistence fishery, it's really hard to, to try to quantify things like effort. Um, participation, not as hard, but especially in this fishery, you can't just talk about number of sets because people, some people set branches, some people set entire trees, some people string multiple trees together. Um, it, it's kind of hard to come up with a standard unit that you can kind of talk about this um, in, a, in a clear and consistent way. So I came up with a couple of questions as a result of being at the Board of Fish. Uh, the first being, do more fishermen actually equal more fish, uh, or in this case, eggs? Uh, is it just a simple matter of people, just, more people just need to get out there and do it? Um, I have a hard time believing this one just because... In any fishery, more fishermen rarely ever equals more fish. Uh, these are scarce resources, limited resources, and there's a limit as to how many fishermen adding will actually get you more output. So then if it's not simply an issue of participation, then what else is a factor that drives success? And because I was working at this with a, from a social science background, I wanted to look at how social science methods like ethnography, direct observations, participatory mapping, how would they better guide an understanding of what made effort and success? Okay. Can I back up? Yeah. What's your definition? Is success I'm, I'm getting to that. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Patience. And then finally, how important is geographic space in creating opportunity? So there's a lot of ways we can define success, obviously. Um, for this purpose, I looked at two basic ways. The first was that since 2002, with a memorandum of understanding, subsistence division, David and his crew have been collecting household survey data, and they have been estimating the total number of pounds of eggs being taken for subsistence use. Um, and so, that was one source of success, was the estimated total harvest. The other one was I was interested in this ability to 
take that harvest and then compare it to what the minimum amount necessary for subsistence was to see just how well we were exceeding that minimum threshold or were we exceeding that minimum threshold. Um, and I and there are some charts uh, in a, on the next slide will help explain that a little bit better, I hope. Um, and so between it, it began, originally in 2002, the, the ANS limits were 105,000 pounds at the low side and 158,000 pounds on the high side. Then after they'd had a couple of years of survey data, they were able to come back and revisit it in 2009. They increased it to 136,000 on the low side and 227,000 on the high side. So is that, a, is that a little bit better? Well, let me see if you tell me if I have this right. You're saying here we could say success is simply how, how many fish or how many eggs you got. So right. You, so you could say this was a really successful year because we got twice as much as last year. Right. Or it was less successful because we got less. Right. That's one. And then you could say you could also define success relative to some need standard. Yes. Relative to this ANS. And so that those are your two working, and both of them relate to the amount you caught. Right. Um, and so you're generally using success in that. In one, in either or both of those contexts, and now you're going to talk about what drives right. success. Yeah, and I'm, a lot of this I'm approaching. I, even though I have a social science background academically, I come from a fishery science background originally, um, and so I approach a lot of this in terms of how how do we how do we measure these in a normal fishery? You know, pounds being or the amount of biomass that you catch being a pretty normal. Um, outcome in... I might, I might generally comment that um, economists typically add, a, put in a different definition. So this is a typical biological definition. Right. Six, more fish, success is more fish. Economists say, yeah, but at what cost? Right. So if you if you go out and catch, you know, 100,000 pounds in one day with one guy, right. that's success. If you go out and catch 100,000 pounds in, you know, 100 days with 100 guys, that's less successful, even though it's right. the same physical outcome. Right. And that's sort of, so is it is it output or is it kind of some kind of definition of profitability right. or, or there's a cost dimension? Well, and how yeah. difficult was it to get it? In, in, in subsistence terms, too, it's, you know, like this stuff doesn't really have a cash value per se, but it does have a, a cultural value. And there are some cash costs. There's fuel, there's boat upkeep and things like that. And subsistence, a lot of the subsistence division reports do kind of get into some of the economic aspects of it. I'm not really an economist, so I tried to stay away from. I I I know a little bit of economics, but I'm you know I don't profess to be that. And I might just add, there's one other potential. And I'm sure we could discuss this more later. Right. Another thing you may define success simply in terms of participation. If if we're engaging in something that's culturally important, then you know. Uh, it's not really about the production. It's more about that we're all out doing this. Right. So if the whole community goes out and does it, that's successful. If only a few old guys do it and right. nobody else cares or gets into it, then that that may be unsuccessful, even if you're getting a lot of fish. Right. So there's a lot of different measures, but well, and uh, I'll, I'll stop. Part of, their, part of your effort metrics. Right. Well, and the participation. How many households? From the, from the cultural side, too, even though in pretty much any subsistence activity, there's only a handful of people that do the bulk of the work. But there's also a, a need for people who may not have the resources to get out and do it themselves. Um, a lot of these communities, a lot of the outlying communities in southeast Alaska, they use herring eggs in a lot of traditional meals and, and festive festivities and things like that, but they can't get that locally. So they depend on a place like Sitka to be able to get their needs met, which is why the ANS isn't just a local Sitka level, it's a statewide level. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's obviously there are a lot of different ways. I, I chose this definition because, number one, the data was there and it's kind of how we were already measuring things. And also because it kind of fit in, it, it fit in with kind of the biological aspect um, of, of success in fisheries management. So, so then if success is an outcome of effort, then what is effort? Well, generally in fisheries, we talk about effort as a function of participation and opportunity. So it's the number of hooks per hour soak time if you're in the black cod fishery. Uh, if you're in the taku uh, gillnet fishery, it could be vessels per day. 
uh, if you're a sport fisherman, it can be the number of angling hours. Um, and so since fishing game, since subsistence division has already been collecting a lot of this data uh, at the household level, a lot of these resources get distributed at a household level. So they do their surveys at that level. So I used household participation rates um, from the 10 years of survey data that we had. But I didn't really have a good idea of what, going into this, of what opportunity consisted of. Um, we, we didn't really have good metrics for opportunity. Um, and so, in, and that's even, the regulations are pretty clear that reasonable opportunity must be provided. Well, how can you know what's reasonable if you're not measuring opportunity in some way? So I, I really wanted to find a way that I can measure that quantitatively while still having some kind of cultural relevance to the subsistence community itself. Okay, so how successful has it been? Uh, this is a bar chart with the, on the y-axis is the harvest in relation to that minimum ANS. So if it goes uh, above zero, that means we exceeded that minimum threshold by, you know, 50,000 pounds. Are you using the ANS, but did the ANS change? Yes. So, so it changed right here, so, or right here. So everything here is on a slightly different scale. Um, because it, the A of the minimum ANS actually went up 36,000 pounds. Let's do a different chart. Yeah. Chart that differently. Um, That's confusing because theoretically they changed it. Mm -hmm. The ANS, it, it probably, that a, the, the latter ANS didn't have a regulatory meeting in earlier years, but it meant that they weren't getting enough, they probably weren't getting enough herring earlier years. Right. Well, we don't have data. I don't have data for before. So this is when the ANS started. No, no, no. I meant, but if the 2010 ANS is different than the 2004. Right. I don't know. I would probably, it's just confusing to standardize it because that, yeah. that shows that it's going down. Uh, but that, but it may not be. You need the absolute catch. Right, right, right. Think. Well, I do have those in a different form. But for the, for just for kind of demonstrating this, I, I do feel like that even though it changed, it didn't, I don't really, you, it really didn't change enough, I don't think, to change. This, these still, even at 100,000, these would have still been below threshold. Um, and this would have okay, been. So you're saying it hasn't changed enough, so I should ignore that issue for the moment. Yeah. And when did it change? Uh, it, it the, before the 2009 harvest season, so. The meeting was in January, so it changed right in here. And then, so this fishery took place after the change. Yeah, there's some, you could look statistics. Anyway, yeah, fairly simply to see that. Yeah. Okay, so, and so this is participation. So this is the number of households within a given year who said that they participated in this fishery. Um, and then. How do you have negative households? Oh, it's a, why, the, the different scale over here. Um, the two lines? Uh, trend lines. So it's an average trend line. Um, so you take these two years, get the average, that's that point, and then the next few years. Um, to just kind of show that, in general, the trend here has been that there has been decline in participation, although it's, it's varied a lot over the years. Um, and we can see that a little bit better in this graph. So this one I did use just the total pounds of, of eggs harvested. And then down on the, the x-axis here, we have the number of participating households. And so, you know, and we're only, so we're only explaining about half the variation here. And the reason is, is that we have huge variation in the number of households that are gathering about the same number of eggs in some years. And so what else can we look at to kind of help explain that, ex, that ad, added variation? So I don't know how many of you watch Doctor Who, but that's a Doctor Who reference. Um, because I, uh, now I want to talk a little bit more about fishing in time and space. Um, so in order for there to be opportunity, there has to be a place and a time where subsistence can occur. And based on traditional knowledge and my own direct observations, 
um, and some of the analysis that I did, I learned that, that there's very fine scale measurements in terms of where subsistence can occur. So even though I may make a set here and it'd be perfectly fine for, for getting good quality eggs, setting at the under, other end of that table may be completely out of the question. Maybe there's a sandbar there. Maybe it's too open to winds and waves. Um, so the, there is a particular definition that has developed over time for what makes a good area. That includes things like rocky shore, looking for a particular low, uh, type of depth. Um, being protected from wind and waves. If you're out on the water and you're setting branches, you don't want your boat being blown around by wind or wave action, which Sitka Sound can have some pretty gnarly waves this time of year. It also takes several days, uh, generally three or more, based on traditional knowledge accounts, uh, of good active spawn to get a th thick deposition of eggs. And if the window is too short, then people just miss out. Um, it's not like a lot of these people are just sitting around waiting for the herring to start spawning. They have jobs, they have responsibilities. And if it's, excuse me, if it starts suddenly and stops suddenly, then people might miss the opportunity to get out and actually get their gear in the water to get the, to get the eggs they need. Can you give us like just a 30 second description of what this is with trees and branches and stuff? I mean, what actually, yeah. I have no concept of okay. what it looks like um, and what you actually do. <laughs> Well, right. Well, I was trying to figure out what to cut and what the, you know, how much I could talk about. Uh, so what happens is, is there, so there are two types of fisheries here. There's the, the row on branch fishery, and then there's the row on kelp fishery. With the row on branch fishery, what will happen is people will go out in skiffs, and they will cut down hemlock trees. Um, not big hemlock trees, but, you know, like, usually they're about four to six feet. Um and, uh, and they, so you, they'll cut them down, they will tie them up with rock bags to weigh them down. Sometimes they will tie them on a string so that you have three or four trees on a single string, like a skate. And they will set them in areas. And they sort of float? No, they sink because they, they weigh them down. Okay. Um, and how deep, okay, and then how deep is this area? Really so they, they're usually set in areas where spawning is already occurring. And they're set, the idea is to set them so that at low, they're still fairly covered by water at low tide. Um, because you don't want gulls and things like that getting into your treetops uh, as, as, at, at low tide. So generally you want to go no deeper than like six feet below low tide um, is where most people tend to, some people will go a little bit deeper. There's, like I said, there can be a lot of variation, but. These trees are standing up. Uh, it depends on how you weigh them. I mean, if you put rock bags at the top of the trees, they will lay completely down. And they will also waterlog as they sit in the water. Um, the herring come along with spawn on. Yeah, so when the tide goes up and the herring come in, the herring spawn, that's the white that you see right there, is herring milt. Um, so, I mean, this time of year, Sitka can get a six foot swell in tides. Um, so, tell me again what the white That's herring, that's milt, that's spawn, semen from herrings. So, <laughs> um, so um, and then this stuff sort of just attaches to the tree. Right. It's very it's very sticky. When it first comes out of the fish, the the eggs are coated in a really sticky substance that water hardens pretty quickly. So the eggs will not only clump together, but they will clump to kelp, rock. Uh, I don't have a picture over here, but when the tide goes down, you'll see you'll see eggs all over the rocks. Um, but they'll, they'll, they, they tend to clump together, and, uh, and I don't think I have a, a picture of the final product on here, um, but I did have some, like, I have pictures, like, in my thesis, like, eggs clump together that thick on hemlock branches, uh, which is uh, what they want. They want, because that thickness of deposition makes it easy to pull off. You can just kind of peel it off from the branches. And, uh, and it doesn't, you know, you don't get a lot of needles stuck in there, surprisingly. Um, but, um, but so then what they do is, so after they've set, so they set the, the, the branches, they check them every day to see how they're progressing. When it looks like either the spawn is tapering off or the branches have a good, thick, heavy deposition on them, they will start hauling those trees, those branches up, and they will, they will limb them up as they go. So that all that's left is the, the main trunk of the tree, which then they just leave in the water. Um, 
and uh, and so they take those big branches of eggs and then they can steam them, they can freeze dry them, they can you know boil them, blanch them, um, do a whole host of things on. And then with the kelp, you can see this this kelp here is macrocystic kelp. Um, it's a very wide li green leaf kelp uh, that. Uh, in, in southeast Alaska, and they will just coat the surface of that kelp. And so then what you can do is you can either dive for it and cut the kelp, or you can run a snag hook, a big weighted treble hook, basically, through the water, and you can snag the leaves and, and retrieve them, and it'll just be caked across the top of the kelp. Uh, and then they'll just sometimes they'll just cut that up and eat it right off the kelp, or they'll peel it off and, and preserve it. Um, you know, the commercial fishermen interested in the grow at all, or are they just that's interested the in the whole, herring fishery? Well, the, the commercial fishery is for the row. It is for the row. How do they do it? Uh, they, now they just freeze dry it and ship it over to Japan. And, do they put trees in the water? Or they have no, they, they catch the, they catch, they're purseining. It's a purseine fishery. So um, vessels go out and they, they drag a, a seine net, purse it up. And then they're mostly interested in the females for the row. And those get shipped to Japan where they're a part of a high dollar uh, uh, sushi market. And uh, so they're really valuable. Well, they just strip them. They just cut them open and strip the row. Um, and they, there's a peak maturity. They don't want them before – they don't want – they want to get them – when the eggs are loose enough in the skein to kind of come loose, but they don't want them so close to spawning that, they're, that the eggs are too loose. Um, so there's a very narrow window when they're valuable to the commercial fishery. And so the commercial, uh, the, the guys at Fishing Game at Comfish, they're always doing samples and looking at how mature the row is and what the age structure or what the, what the gender structure is in terms of how many males and how many females. So that they can get them, so that when they're harvesting, they're getting the most ripe females they can, because males come out of the GHL, the guideline harvest level, but they're not really marketable. As I mean, there's no eggs in them, so they're not really marketable on the markets. Now, it, elsewhere, other than Sitka, there's other commercial fisheries. There's like a commercial go on kelp fishery in the south. Right. There's a pound fishery. It's is what they call it. It's right. uh, the, it's they. They corral herring into, um, you know, into a net where they're they are la they have stretches of kelp that the herring spawn on, and then they collect the. They don't do that here, not in this particular fishery. That's in Chatham Strait. Uh, Prince Sound. Yeah, Prince William Sound. Yeah, right. um, and there are only two commercial purseine fisheries in Alaska. There's one here, and then there's one in Dillingham. And those are the only two commercially viable stocks of herring left in the state of Alaska. Herring used to stretch all the way from Ketchikan to the Aleutians, but during the collapse of the whale fisheries, herring became a substitute for whale oil. And so you had these massive cannery operations that opened in southeast Alaska, especially in the Chatham Strait area, where they caught hundreds of thousands of pounds of herring for oil, for uh, fish meal. They weren't really using the row in those days. But so th these fisheries have been all but depleted and this fishery has only started rebounding in about the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and so that's another part of the conflict here is that the biomass estimates that, that fishing game does for how big the stock is keep going up. And as a result, the guideline harvest level, which is 20% of the biomass, keep going up. And yet you have subsistence users who are seeing less and less opportunity, less and less outcome for their effort. Um, and and they're, they're blaming that on the commercial fishery. Um, so um, is there any other questions? Can I go? <laughs> I got kind of lost there. Um, so. Like I said in the last slide, there's, these are very fine scale measurements, and there's a very particular definition of, of what a good place is. So this picture here is actually one of the, the most preferred areas. It's one of the most heavily fished areas. This is Middle Island. The city of Sitka is right back here. Um, and this, this cove will get 
30 or 40 sets of branches in it when the, the herring are really in here. And the reason it's, it's, it's preferred is because it's got a nice quick drop off in depth. It's got real thick, heavy gravel and big boulder rocks on the bottom all throughout here. Um, that there's not a lot of sand in this area. It's, it's a big bowl of a cove and I'll show it to you on a bigger map. That's really protected. Um, a lot of wind comes from this direction in Sitka. And so it's really well protected from the wind and waves. And then this is an, why do we care about gravel? <laughs> because it's a clean substrate to set on top of. So if you have a lot of sand and the, and, and the wind picks up and the waves start to slosh around, you can get sand in your eggs. And when you're chomping down on about a mouthful of herring eggs, the last thing you want is to just feel like you're chewing on sandpaper. Um, so they try to avoid any place with a lot of sand or where sand could get blown in. Um, and then this is another area south, just on the other side of this area is this cove here. You can't really see it in this picture, but there's a big rock island here that is real popular. And I was actually fishing with a setting branches with a guy, and he he told me that he he told me he's like, you know, like we made a set right here, and as we were drifting out, he said we can't set farther out where we were because there was too much sand in that area. So it can, and that, the difference was a difference between me to you. So it's it can be very precise as to where these branches need to go in order to get a good quality product. Okay, so then I needed to try to come up with a way to quantify this, you know, idea of fishing in time and space. So on the left here is aerial survey maps done by Comfish, uh, and these represent, so every day that there's active spawn, they fly out in a spot plane, and they take a map, and they mark this stretch of shoreline was getting spawned, this stretch of shoreline was getting spawned, and then they convert it to a, a shape file in ArcGIS, and so where you see multiple lines stacked on top of each other, that's multiple days of spawn in an area. This pocket right here is where that second picture from the last slide was taken. The last picture was taken from right in here. But the problem is, is that this is kind of messy data. So I took NOAA Shore Zone Database, which is a, a wonderful habitat database that NOAA has developed, and I transferred all of this, these attributes, to their shoreline sections. And so what you see here is the darker shades of red represent a, a greater number of spawning days, whereas the, just the dotted lines themselves represent no spawn whatsoever. Um, and, they can, and so you get an idea of just how some of these areas, again, this is from the second picture that I showed, how, how some of these areas can be real hot spots for where herring are spawning. So herring are spawning in a particular place. Uh, they're not just randomly spawning around here. And so once I had that database put together, I could then do some statistical analysis on it. And the first thing I wanted to look at was just how uneven was the distribution in terms of where herring spawn. And so I did what's called cluster analysis uh, in, in ArcGIS, and it came back showing that, yes, these stretches of shoreline are in fact highly clustered. So, um, so, so it's not just a random or an even distribution of herring spawn. The herring are spawning in certain areas for certain periods of time. The numbers you see here correlate to uh, areas on the subsistence harvest survey. And then this shows the same, uh, so that was, a lo that was a global cluster analysis, but we can also do local cluster analysis, which identifies certain stretches of shoreline as high value or high spawn day clusters. So that's what the red is. The blue means that these areas rarely ever see any spawn whatsoever. The black means that sometimes they get spawned, sometimes they don't. Um, but we can see when we zoom into this core area that most of this core area is areas that in, a, in any given year they consistently get a high number of spawn spawning days. So it is multi-year data that yes. makes something more, okay. Yeah, I had 12 years of aerial spawn map data from Fishing Game, um, 2000 to 2012. Um, I only had 10 years of harvest data from subsistence division, but um, I took it out as far as I could. So, so then the next thing was to figure out where people harvest, why they harvest there. So I did participatory mapping and was able to, you know, I sat down with key respondents, 
elders, knowledgeable people who participate in the fishery, and I said, what areas do you use? And they would mark it on a map. And then I digitized it um, to a certain depth. And, and what this allowed me to do was then I can match up these areas to that, to that spawn map database that I created. And I could distinguish between areas that were outside of the subsistence use versus areas that were within subsistence use. And what that allowed me to do is within any given year, I could tally up the total number of spawn days within all subsistence areas, divide by the total number of shoreline sections in subsistence areas, and I could get what uh, I called an, a mean spawn day or an average spawn day. So it's the average window of opportunity that you would have in any particular shoreline section uh, in a subsistence area. Okay, so. So the total number of spawning days for all subsistence shoreline. For each shoreline added together? Yes. Okay. So the sum the sum of all of so the sum of the spawn for this area and this area and this area and this area and this area and, and all of these areas, I summed that all together and divided it. So there are multiple sections of shoreline in here. So then I divided it by the total number of shorelines that were found in subsistence areas. Days per mile or something. Well, it's section. It's it's not a it's not a distance as much as a count. Okay. Does that make sense? So it's days per section. Within all subsistence areas. Okay, so then, so if we look at, so when I calculated that across the 10 years of our study, of my study period, I come up with this scatter plot that you see, the, the pyramids, and we see that the average number of spawn days increases with, you know, the, the same trend, the black line is the trend line for the spawn days. It increased in 2004, it kind of dipped down into 2008, 2009, and then it spiked again, uh, well, it spiked again in 2009, 2010, and then it kind of dropped off again. So, so what's the black line again? It's the average, it's a trend line, so it's an average trend line. So okay, you, uh, it's an average trend line of the triangle. Yes. So your top darker line, yes. and the dots that it is representing a trend of, is based surely on physical conditions, sort of how many. Yes. It's a measure of how many herring were actually how many, sort of there. How many days that they were there. How, how many days, you know, but it's, it's physical, a physical measure, whereas your blue, your blue bars and, and your, uh, your other line, that that trend shows the actual catch, sort of measures of actual success, as you define Yes. It. Yes. And they, they oh. begin to digress, to diverge from each other near the end. Right. Which you're going to come to. Right. Okay, but the, the pieces, maybe it's on another slide, but, or another chart, but as I recall from your earlier one when you had the, the yield, but also the participation, I was going to ask you this at the end, but since I see there were a lot of spawn days as well, um, so how come fewer people went after as I recall, there was kind of a spike in 2009, and then the last three years, there seemed to be fewer participants. Right. So why did you find out why that was? Um, if it looks like the, the crop was okay, to use a different term, or the right. resource was there, it wasn't a bad fishing year. There's There's been a lot of things that have happened. Uh, some harvesters have retired, some have died. Um, to me, that, that's critical for participation. If, if, the spawning days, if, if the catch is available, or the resource is available, but fewer people are doing it, right? You know, that would be a key to under, understanding that part of participation would be really key. Right. So and some people retired, and but what else? So, and subsistence division has more data. Like David could probably tell you better, and in a quicker way than I probably could, maybe. Um, Why are the catches as good as the catch? 
Right. Well, I'm trying to trying okay. to build up to that. So that you finish it and then go back to that maybe. Um, so then this is another scatter plot with the average spawn days and the, the total number of eggs harvested. Um, and again, we see that there's a huge variation in terms of, you know, as, as little as a half day to a day and a half, you know, we're still seeing upwards to 50,000 pounds of eggs being harvested. One interesting thing that I, that I also want to point out is that these three dots here are all from the last three years of the study period when that trend changed even though the partic even though the outcome didn't so even so that's these three years here so even though they were really high here you know the, the the harvest trend was still pretty low and when you take those three out you actually get um i don't have it up there but you actually get a much tighter regression in terms of how that window of opportunity affects uh harvest Okay, so now let's try to put this all together, now that everybody's thoroughly confused. Um, so I felt like a better definition, better, you know, should accurately explain variations in harvest in a way that we can measure, but also measure in a way that's culturally important, culturally significant. Um, and, I, and so often in the cultural accounts, people talk about they just didn't have enough opportunity. There wasn't enough when there wasn't a big enough window of time. That, you know, and in 2012, this was definitely the case where the act of spawn only really lasted in, in pockets in for a day or two. So it would be a day or two here and a day or two there and a day or two here. And by the time people would get out there and get their branches in the water, they would have already missed the peak of the spawn. And so then they would have to try to move their branches. Sometimes they move their branches to better areas. So then if they moved their branches and they didn't get their branches in the new area in time, they, they were still kind of chasing the, the spawn. And it, 2012 was a terrible year. Not a lot of people got a lot of good eggs. So we go back to this definition of uh, effort, participation and opportunity. What you just described, though, was not uh, a regulatory opportunity. Right. It was just the way this, the fish spawn. Right. Okay. So it seems like those two are, because what you said earlier is, well, if, it, if, they op if the opening is too short, guys who have jobs can't, like, well, the opening is based on when the fishery, when the fish are spawning. It's not like an open. It's not like a we open this by emergency order. You can go out and set your branches. Uh, it's a hey, the herring are spawning. Let's get our gear out and, and get our eggs. Oh, okay. So it's not a. It's not, it's not like regular. it's not like a season. It's yeah. Um, so I define effort as the number of households harvesting times the average number of spawn days that I was able to calculate. And I came up with something that I just kind of in shorthand called the number of household days. Um, is average spawn days the days when spawning is available? Can you go back to that, please? Okay. Or is the average spawn days the average amount of time they were out doing it? The, uh, the average time available then, to them, so based on when the herring were spawning. Then that's not effort. If, if there were 10 days. No, that's opportunity. Then... That's the opportunity for them to get out and do it. Yeah, but how does that, that doesn't correspond to effort. Effort would be number of households times number of hours or days those households were out doing it versus opportunity would be, all right, they had 10 days, but they only went out an average of three days times 50 households or whatever it is. Well, I get the household. Well, first of all, just so I understand, what you, are you saying your three bottom lines are represent, in your mind, potential alternative definitions of effort? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. And so, the, so the top one says, like, say that it would be 50 households and um, they had... Uh, and those 50 households had uh, X number of spawning days that they could. Right. And so, so that would be, so you have, if you have better spawning days, then you have more effort under that potential definition. Yes. Your second one says you got your 50 households. 
and, um, and it's sort of related to the first one. Well, it's, it's the same. same. They're all the same. same but the okay. But so you're, it's a combination of how many people as well as what quality of opportunity it was? Yes. That's what so I'm not is, following because. This is not, this is not about what effort they put in, but what effort they could have put yes. in. Yes. Potential. Okay. Potential effort. That they put in. Yes. All right. All right. Okay. Potential effort. That would be a much better definition. Okay. All right. Because effort is Good kind enough. of like actual, right. actual days on. Well, I think it, I, honestly, I feel like it's a pretty safe assumption that if they have those days available to them, they're going to be out there doing it. Um, no, but I mean, if the number of days go down, because, okay, well, I think it's will. Okay. So then, when I calculated household days for these 10 years, this is the trend I come up with. And so we can see that the the opportunity spikes in 2004 as does the the total you know as does the ability to exceed that minimum ans and then it, it follows a very the 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 average trend line which the black one is the trend line for the household days they follow along almost parallel throughout the entire study period they, you know, except for 2005 it's all they're exact yeah but shouldn't shouldn't you then be using the Absolute catch. Well, I rather than the I did. You know, the catch, how, how it exceeded the you know, no, the I, well, harvest when yeah. the harvest changed. You could go back for a second. Okay. There are only like twenty percent difference. So just add about this much to the blue line on the top. Subtract this much and yeah, and visualize good. it. So no, I have to visualize it, but I, I think it would be better metric. No, I agree with I agree with Heather. But that's okay. If you get to the next slide, okay. you get what you want. Right. So then this is the household days on the X, the total eggs on the Y. And we get a really nice, this was significant, P of less than 0 0.01 um, with an R square of 0 0.8668. Um, and, and so it shows that when you have, you know, a higher, when you have more opportunity and more people harvest, more households harvesting, you tend to get better results uh, in terms of the number of eggs you, you collect. But take either one of those away in too much and you see, you start to see declines. So what's the variation of participation? Um... I don't know off the top of my head. Because if you go back to that next slide, the reason, now, the reason why 2010 through 2012 are low could be right because people were, you know, everybody my age was, you know, complaining about that. Right. If participation is too low, it can bring down the effect that having a bigger window of opportunity provides. Yeah, but also, and it also brings down the success. Right. So okay. you're saying, what you're saying is how much you get is partly affected by how many people are out there and also by the quality of the quality of the opportunity. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the big. Or so you haven't so, really, so the next, so the uh, R squared of 0.86 partially rebuts the Herring industry group. Right. Not completely. Cause, no. Because we go, hey. It's, um, participation is still important. You still have to have bodies in the water. Right. And so the question is, how much variation was If there's a lot of variation, right. then in fact, they could be right. And if there's no variation, then in fact, they're wrong. Right. Well, when I looked at just participation in terms of total eggs, the R square value was only like 0. 0.5 no, something. That's not the question. The question is, how many? How much is there a downward decrease in participation? Just plain. Oh, yeah. Okay. Was the answer. Have you finished? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty much finished. Okay, can you go back to that one that has participation? It was near the beginning. Let's see. Is 
this is like that commercial they run the year. Uh, but yeah, 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 back when the little kid was just going to go. Okay, <laughs> so number of household responses or number of is that participation? No, that's not participation. Yeah, that is the number of households who said that they were participating in the fishery. Okay, so I guess my question is, I'm still confused about why was there that spike in 2009, and if you just take the three years since then, it seems that the participation is dramatically lower than the average or the trend line would have been if it was just 2002 to 2009. So do we know what caused that anomaly? Whether that was because of days of opportunity I'd, or... I'd have to go back and look at the... That's what has to change if you want to really rebut it to say, well, all right, so the participation is so low where people, as you said, some people retired or was there no interest or they perceive there wasn't much wasn't worth doing or what because if you're right that participation is an important factor as well as opportunity number of days then don't you have to figure out if there were is there ways to increase participation right well or am i missing something? well here here is what interests me first of all it makes total sense to me if you say if you want to know how much people get Think back to my strawberry picking days. You know, how many strawberries did I pick? Mm -hmm. You know, when I was a professional child labor person picking strawberries for right. work. And it was a function of how long I worked, right. as well as the quality of the picking. So right. if, if the picking was great, then you get a lot in a short period of time and it was bad. So it's going to be a function of how many people are out there and um, and then what's the quality. So I think it's it's very interesting. You've demonstrated that it's it's that both of these matter. Right. You got that correct? Yeah. Now, if now people come and say, well, gee, we're not getting enough. Um, and then if, if we're not we're not we're not able to meet our needs, or it's getting harder to meet our needs, we're frustrated that we can't meet our needs. Then um, if if people say, well, it's because not enough of you are, you know, not enough of you are fishing, and then you could you could rebut that and say, well, uh, actually it that's not sufficient. You have to look at what's the quality of, of the fishing right. to, to see that. But the part that I find interesting is something you haven't mentioned, which would be the interaction between the amount of people mm -hmm. fishing and the quality, mm -hmm. or the quality of the opportunity. Right. So I would hypothesize that, and this is very simplistic, that if, if I know that there's, but I don't know whether people can know this in advance, if, if it's if it's not very good fishing, then not then fewer people are going to go out. So it's right. kind of a double yeah, whammy. No, no, I think he did that because if you go back to about the end slides, now we're going to everybody nuts. No, it's good. I um, if uh, uh, okay, that one. No, didn't you have one that showed? Were you what, what I showed, showed is the relationship between effort, between participation and fishing quality. I mean, did, didn't you have one that did like the, the that just showed the, the the sections per year that were available? Did you have a slide that showed that? The map. Yeah, right after the map. That one or that one? Right, right, right. So the the, the triangles right. are the amount of sections available per year, right? So that's opportunity in the normal sense. There's a lot of sections available. Right. So that that would show that, that there isn't a relationship between there isn't a a, cor, a, a a correlation between fishing and opportunity and households participation. I think you're asking more in terms of like how does time affect the level of no, deposition? No, no, I believe I'm to channel my inner gunner. Um, I don't have an inner gunner yet. What that shows is that because of the amount of days on sections, right, they were high, right, and yet the number of 
people participating yes. was low. That's what I'm trying to get Therefore, to. the hypothesis that the quality affected participation, that is a low quality of opportunity, meant that less people wouldn't be true. Doesn't seem to doesn't, doesn't seem to fit. True. So what else is going on? Yeah. I didn't well, if another it, hypothesis if that they have more satisfying hypothesis, you got a target, and so. So the question is, do you fish more or less if the quality of right. opportunity is good? The, and the, the, you one, argument is, one argument is, oh, if it's terrible fishing, I'm not going to put so much effort into it. And the other is, if it's terrible fishing, I'm going to put more into it, effort into it because I need yeah. to put more effort into it. Right. And I don't but have a good way of measuring that. Yeah, did you ask when you, when you did these household oh. surveys? Or they uh, well, Fishing Game does these every year. I helped with... Uh, uh, David just quiet. left. Uh, did, you do a, did you work on this last year? So this slide and the other one, I think, shows that there is no negative. Uh, well, good, poor quality opportunity is not, doesn't appear to be motivating lower household. But then the question of this good opportunity motivate lower household well and a good opportunity may encourage the the key harvesters to put out more branches too because there are lots of areas that they can set in let's see where was that so i mean there's a there's a lot of areas that they could set in depending on where the spawn is taking place um i mean this is this is a whole stretch of you know a couple of miles of road run right along here um, but what tends to happen is like these areas here, this area here tend to get the best spawn. And I actually did kind of break these out and I didn't include it in this cause I was worried about time, but I, I had I, people identify their most preferred areas. So where do they look first? And you know, and it, it tends to be here and here and here and here in those areas are have a higher average in terms of the amount of time than most of these areas than just all these areas combined basically this is interesting and you effectively frighten them okay so if we come back to the original issue which was should there be areas set aside for subsistence this doesn't really tell right us, tell us whether yeah, there were... we, did you get to your conclusions <laughs> uh Kinda, not really. Um, so let's see. James, I'd be interested in seeing the regression equation. Okay. Yeah, I I will admit my statistics is like like it's. No, I just want to know all the variables that run in there and what explains the R square and how much of each of those variables explains how much of R square. Yeah, I would be glad to have somebody help me look at that a little bit more in depth. I have one last question. <laughs> So, no, not for this presentation. I got it for Valentine's Day. <laughs> before I have to leave, um, I hope faculty here uh, noticed GIS functionality yeah. that he used. Exactly. And I'm losing him in two months. <laughs> less than two months. He's going to the East Coast of Canada. Yeah, could you land. To Walker? What's that? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> He's not even Newfoundland by. Yep. So, and, and this was one question that was brought up, you know, I, I feel like space is important. There's a lot of work that's needed on what causes spatial variation and where the spawning occurs. Because some years it occur, there's more spawning that occurs outside of subsistence areas. Um, but I don't really, I didn't really have the data to kind of look into what may be affecting that in terms of if the commercial fishing is causing this, this, the herring to disperse and spawn in unusual places, but I, that was kind of the last, that was to me the, the best unanswered question of the research that I did. Um, Anything there's else? a comment. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm not by any means a uh, sort of advocate of uh, sort of making everything into economics or, or so on, but one thing that economists tend to do, if you've presented you presented a hypothesis and, in effect, um, some models of potential things that are driving what's going on, and then and you kind of tested these hypotheses. Right. But so it's been a little hard for us to follow because it's 
we haven't quite understood what you're saying. I think some of this could be written down as sort of mathematical relationships. It's simply saying, you know, y is a positive okay. function of x, or, or or so on, and then and then sort of if if you were a little bit more formal in specifying the nature of the relationships that you're hypothesizing and testing for, and it would help to more clearly show what you did and also to show the tests that you did. Um, I'd have to spend, you know, 15 minutes or half an hour sort of trying to write it down to do that, but I think that could be done. Um, and uh, beyond that, I, I would say I, I do agree with you that um, it's absolutely insufficient to simply say, oh, we can, it, it's all about, it's all about participation as measured by number of households participating. Right. And clearly, you have to you have to talk about sort of what's the quality of the opportunity, and then you've gotten your maps and so on make clear how how challenging that is to actually right incorporate because it's partly sort of how spread out is it and where what places and how many days and you've tried you've tried to boil all that down into some a sort of single measure that could somehow accommodate that. Right. You know, a different approach would be to sort of have several different aspects of quality that you somehow test for their combined effect as opposed to trying to incorporate it in one particular thing. In other words, there's sort of the timing aspect of quality, there's the, the um, uh, you know, sort of kind of number of segments, and right. you know, I'm not sure how to define it. But you've tried to, you've tried to sort of say, here's a way of boiling it all down into one right. quality number. And I'm thinking that, that you might want to explore different methods of that or potentially multi multivariate measures. The problem with that is that you have to have ways of quantifying all of that. And that I think that you run and that's I feel like even your single measure is in fact a formula based on right. a couple uh, two or three things. Right. So you might you might think about whether that's the only way to combine them or whether there are ways to use them individually. Okay. You got measures in them. So it's it's great. You've definitely achieved one goal of this kind of research, which is to sort of get get the listener interested and also identify more questions. Yeah. Well, that's always the goal of science, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.